at UC Berkeley back when we were students. This was over a decade ago. And we just realized that in a lot of college classes, they touch on public health, social justice, and sustainability, but they weren't talking about the connection to that and food. So as students, we started to go up to our professors and say, hey, can we give presentations in your classes? And since then, our presentations have been so well received that we are in 10 different regions all across the United States, and we have partnered with Green Monday, which is part of the program that I'm going to be speaking with you about today. And I really wasn't sure what to talk about during today's presentation because we really do try and connect it to a lot of different social justice issues, and that's really key to our work. If I am going to a school in East Oakland to talk about food, and the kids are like, hey, Monica, I really care about immigrant rights, I'll say, yeah, me too, and let's talk about the workers, right, who's working in these factory farms, who's working on these agricultural lands. Uh, if the kids are really worried about uh, disease, maybe I'm going to a nursing uh, class, then I'll talk about a lot of the public health concerns that we have. So really, why I love doing this work is because it really does connect many things together. And that's why it's our passion here today. So let's get started by talking about um, the impact of food on the environment. And then we'll delve into different solutions. And I want to talk to you all about the global climate youth strike that's coming up on September 20th, and then some of our other activism opportunities. So first of all, National Geographic said it really well. When we think about threats to the environment, we tend to picture cars and smokestacks, not dinner. But the truth is, our need for food poses one of the biggest dangers to the environment. And reading this, it really did ring very true for me. I grew up here in the Bay Area, and I remember like, when we were talking about big environmental issues, we were talking about the Chevron refinery or somebody spilling oil or something into the Bay. Farming just seems so innocuous. Let's really think about what farming is like, and I know that this is a really educated group, but does anybody know how many animals, specifically land animals, so not including fish, how many land animals we are raising for food in the United States every year? Just a guess? Four billion. Four billion? Okay. <laughs> it's nine billion, all right? This is just land animals only in the United States. Okay. And I want to take a moment to really think about what this number means because 9 billion animals just in the U.S. is more than we have people on the entire planet. And if you look at percentages, there's only about 300 plus million Americans, right? So this is a really outsized impact compared to the rest of the world. We really are raising a lot of animals. And of course that matters. I'm here at the Soil Not Oil conference, so as you know, those animals require a lot of corn and soy that we grow in monocultures. If you've been to parts of the Midwest, what used to be prairies and marshes is now just that one crop. It is just the soy or the corn. And that's problematic for several reasons. All right, so I'm, I want us to actually forget about this graph for a second, all right? Forget about the graph, and I want to imagine, right, that you had $100. Would you give me that $100 if in exchange I gave you a coupon for $40? No, right? What if you gave me $100 and I gave you a voucher to your favorite restaurant for $3? Would you take that deal? Absolutely not, right? Although when I give this presentation to kids, they're always like, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so thank you, audience, for realizing, yeah, we don't want to give $100 to get back $40. But really, this is what we are doing with our food system. For every 100 calories of corn and soy that we feed to animals, we get back 40 calories worth of milk down to just three calories worth of beef. All right, think about it for if any of you have a dog or a cat at home. If you were to stockpile all the dog food that your dog eats in an entire year, the weight of that dog food uh, the calories in that dog food is far greater than like the actual flesh on the dog's bones itself, okay? So this is a really inefficient system, and it matters, right? I, I'm, I'm 29 years old, I'm still going to be alive, I hope, in 2050, when, as <laughs> many of you know, we just sort of like stop having climate projections. I work a lot with youth, and we are really concerned about what's going to be happening in the future. We see this rise in the global population as well. We know that there's malnutrition, world hunger. How do we address these things? Well, first of all, we know that if everyone ate half as much meat, we could use that land to grow enough food to feed everyone on Earth today, plus an extra two billion people. What this means is, Instead of just growing corn and soy that we feed to animals, we take some of that land and we use it to grow vegetables, beans, right, fruits, all those 
things for people to be eating directly. If we did that, we could feed vastly more people. Animal agriculture, as many of you know, is one of the leading causes of deforestation worldwide. And raise your hand if you've been hearing about what's happening in the Amazon rainforest right now with the burning. Okay, so many people do not realize that one of the major causes of that burning is that they are clearing the land to make room for more corn and soy or more room for the cattle to live off of, right? This is the primary, one of the primary contributors to our Amazon rainforest going up in flames. So much of um, the discourse that I hear in the environmental movement is actually around the overpopulation of humans, and it is a concern, <laughs> not gonna lie. But if you think about the wild mammals on this planet, Okay. There was a time when 100% of the mammals on this planet were all wild beings. But humans have now made it so that only 4% of mammals are wild. Okay. The other mammals are humans, and then nearly two-thirds of the mammals on this planet are livestock for humans to eat. So when we talk about the overpopulation of human beings, I think we're also talking about the overpopulation of livestock. I'm here in the Bay Area. There are a lot of people who talk about trying to do this in a more sustainable fashion, having more cows that have more room to grow and walk around. And ultimately, there's no way to do it on this scale, right? Think about all the people you know who are eating animal products. There is no way to have nine billion animals <laughs> raised in this kind of way. And it also is ultimately still contributing to all the environmental degradation that I'll be talking about later. So. If you want to learn more about this, read Grazed and Confused. It's really clear that just switching to grass-fed beef is not a solution. So we have all this corn and soy. You know that we're feeding it to animals. And another thing is that here in California, we were really concerned about the drought, right? And I have gone to many hundreds of high schools and colleges at this point, and I always ask the students, hey, have you heard of the drought? They all say, yes, Monica, I have. I say, great, okay. And what were you told to do to help with this drought? And every single kid, no matter which school I go to, whether it's in Richmond, East Oakland, San Francisco, they all say, uh, turn off the tap and take shorter showers. And I'm seeing a lot of you nodding because that's exactly what you've been told as well. But the truth of the matter is that if you go to saveourwater.org, all of the suggestions like taking shorter showers just focuses on our direct impact and not our indirect impact. We know that somebody not consuming a gallon of milk is the equivalent of 27 days of showers, okay? And by the way, all our citations are on our website. So how is this possible? Well, <clears throat> this gallon of milk looks very innocuous, but think about it. That gallon of milk required the cow to consume a lot of corn and soy. That required a lot of water. You also have the water involved in the animal drinking it, the spraying it down to production facilities. So truly, if you want to help save water, our food choices do make a really big impact. And here in California, there was a time when the almond industry was um, being accused of using up a lot of water. And I want to be clear that, yeah, the almond industry does use up a lot of water. But look at how much more water the cow milk industry uses. Okay? And whenever I'm talking about all these things, I'm not necessarily trying to push people to drink any one of these milks in particular. But I want to show how complex it is, right? Like if you wanted to uh, save water, or conserve water, right? Maybe soy milk is something that you'd want to consider. But then again, if you want to look at land use, maybe it would be rice milk. The point is, though, that cow's milk is the least efficient. <laughs> right, and that's from the New York Times. All right, so we have these nine billion animals. They're consuming a lot of water, a lot of corn and soy. I didn't talk about how we're feeding them hormones <laughs> and also antibiotics. And it goes through their system, and what does it come out as? <laughs> Poop, feces, scat. I used to be an environmental educator, so I know all the synonyms. <laughs> Yeah, so we know that farm animals in the U.S. produce 100 times as much poop as the entire U.S. human population. And so the question then becomes, what do we do with it? Does anybody know how we get rid of all of this waste? Sometimes kids will say, Monica, can we compost it? Can we use it as fertilizer? And I say, that's a really great idea, but the concern is that if these animals have a lot of hormones and antibiotics, right, that is actually toxic waste.
One of America's biggest secrets is that farms practically don't exist anymore. The animals we eat are grown inside giant hidden factories. Since 2012, I've been secretly planning a project to expose these factory farms using the highest tech spy equipment available. Drones. This video provides just a sample of what I saw during only a few days of filming. You're looking at a lake of toxic pig feces and urine the size of four football fields. That's because thousands upon thousands of pigs are inside of these buildings. Their waste falls through slats in the concrete floor and it's flushed directly into this giant open air cesspool. How many of these kinds of factories are there? In North Carolina alone, there are over 2,000 and the consequences are disastrous. The waste falls through, through the floors. It's flushed out into an open pit, like a cesspool. It's easy for a big hog operation to have as much waste as a medium-sized city. Of course, the pit will fill up, so it has to be uh, emptied, and they're emptied by spraying the liquid waste. Yes, you heard that right. If you're familiar with a garden sprayer, they're gigantic versions of that, so they're making droplets, fine mists, out of this liquid waste, and that can drift downwind into the neighboring communities. I shut my hog operation down, and I got out of it. And uh, I, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't do another person that way to make them smell that. It is a cesspool that you put feces and urine in, a hole in the ground that you dump a toxic waste in. And I've seen dead hogs in them and stuff like that. People can't open their windows, they can't go outside. I've seen it. I've talked to the people. I've seen the little children that say, Mom and Daddy, why we got to smell this stuff? You get stories like, I can't hang my clothes out. Feces and urine odor comes by and attaches itself to your clothes. And then people will say, we're scared to invite neighbors. It can, I think, very correctly be called environmental racism or environmental injustice that uh, people of color, low-income people, bear the brunt of these practices. This is where they spray animal waste on us. It's about eight feet from my mother's house. What is it like when the mist is? It's like, you think it's raining? Really? You, th you think it's raining. We don't open the doors or, or the windows, but the odor still comes in. It takes your breath away. Then you start gagging, you get headaches. There are a number of studies of asthma and asthma symptoms, particularly in children near these facilities. Among adults, there are reports of several types of upper respiratory symptoms. These pollutants are affecting people's blood pressure. Who's responsible for all this? Smithfield Foods, specifically the subdivision Murphy Brown which controls the factory farms shown in all of the drone footage in this video. Smithfield is by far the largest pork producer in the entire world. And inside these buildings, there is something else entirely. Pigs are really intelligent animals. They are more intelligent than dogs. They are more intelligent than cats. In the average pig barn, there could be hundreds, if not thousands of pigs crammed into this one sprawling indoor space. Their entire life is spent standing on concrete floors. Mother pigs are locked in metal cages so small that they literally cannot even turn around for months at a time. This is not a partisan issue. We are all opposed to children being made sick, to animals being abused, and to everyday people's lives being ruined by the stench of cesspools in their backyards. These thousands of lakes of toxic waste must be among the most bizarre and disturbing environmental phenomena that have ever confronted America. And they've been kept well hidden from the public for long enough. In this particular video, they specifically pull out the term environmental racism. And I want to take a moment to explain what they mean by this term. First of all, Elsie here, this land that she got from her grandfather, he got it from his former slave over and owner. This is an area that is experiencing a lot of poverty and has for many generations now. This is in North Carolina. Thank you. And 
We talk about environmental racism because if a hog factory farm wanted to open up in San Francisco, do you think that everybody here would be cool with it? No, because quite frankly, we have political resources, financial resources, educational resources. We have a ton of different universities here. And we would fight back and we would say, NIMBY, not in my backyard. We still want to eat bacon and pork and whatever. But we do not want to have this waste in our backyard. We do not want our children to get asthma from this, right? So the factory farm would go, OK, not in San Francisco. Again, the, the factory farm might go to another community. If people have the resources to fight back, they'll say, OK, not here. So where do you think a hog factory farm ends up? In the lowest income communities, which tend to be communities of color. And you see that even in uh, California, right? Like if you've ever driven down I-5 <laughs> and there's that section of the freeway where you're like, oh my goodness, right? That's not in San Francisco on purpose. Okay. So again, the term is environmental racism. The factory farms will often say that we are being extraordinarily benevolent coming to this community because we are providing so many jobs. And to that, I give the analogy of Walmart. When Walmart comes to community, right, they say we will provide a lot of jobs. But what happens is the small little grocery store goes out of business. The small little hardware store goes out of business. So there ends up being a net loss in jobs. And when you talk to many farmers in middle America who are upset, <coughs> I mean, this is partially what's going on. Because in the Bay Area, a lot of our environmental movements, they make a really big deal. And I, again, used to be an environmental educator. I have probably told 30,000 kids at this point in my life to bring one of these with them everywhere. And that's great. Like, I'm not <laughs> giving myself shit for that. But this is, this is the same thing that we've been doing for a decade now, right? Like, telling people to bring their reusable water bottles. But can everybody drink water out of the tap? So is this, like... If this is going to be our slogan, if this is going to be the most environmentally friendly thing that we do, there's, there's problems with that, right? We have to be thinking about our messaging and our access. So, of course, another issue with all this waste is that it does contribute to climate change. We know for a fact that animal agriculture causes more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation sector combined. And I want to say like around last year, after Trump was pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords, when people realized that the Paris Climate Accords were talking about reducing our emissions by a certain percentage. If Americans replace beef with beans, we could immediately achieve up to 75% of our greenhouse gas reduction goals. So it does make an impact. And I talk to kids about this because here in this area, I think a lot of kids feel really disempowered. They don't feel like they have a lot of control over what the federal government is doing. And I really recognize that. And there are also certain things that kids can be doing, youth can be doing, older adults can be doing that really do make a big difference collectively. Ultimately, it's a really big problem. I only talked about a few of the environmental ones. Again, this really does relate to so many other social justice issues. And increasingly, world leaders, except our own in the UN and others, they're all saying the basic solution is simple, right? We have to be eating less animal products. The UN says we need to have our meat consumption. Uh, this one goes a little bit further just because they were trying to find specific numbers for keeping climate change under two degrees. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with climate activist Paul Hawken, but he's very well known. And he analyzed the top 100 solutions for addressing climate change. And you will notice that two of the top five relate to what we are eating. Okay. And I think that this is really noteworthy because this, this is the stuff that people can actually do, right? Reducing food waste, plant-rich diet. A lot of individuals don't have a lot of control over refrigerant management and like where we set up wind turbines. Um, I feel like in the environmental movement, we still take, make a really big deal about solar. But again, that's number 10, right? Our food really does matter. So. We're at a point where I think there has been more conversation around the connection between food and climate change. So we have some other figures hopping on board. 
And as an organization, the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition, we partnered with Green Monday because we really do want to meet people where they're at. We are extraordinarily conscious of the communities that we go to. We recognize that people eat the way that they do because it's cultural, because of the cost, right? The accessibility, all those things. So I never go to a community and just say, hey, you need to start eating healthily because I can, right? I understand that there are people who don't have uh, some of these privileges. But we do know that if everyone in the U.S. ate no meat or cheese just one day a week, it would be like taking 7.6 million cars off of the road. And I always ask the kids, hey, can you think of like two adults in your life who you could convince to sell their car and never drive again? Can any of you? No, it's really hard, right? Much less to imagine 7.6 million. But you probably know somebody who you could convince to, hey, maybe you could go and eat a burrito that contains rice and beans and salsa and guacamole and all the other fixings, right? Those, those plant-based fixings. That would make a really big difference, right, cumulatively. Now, I want to talk about some other solutions that are being proposed right now. I'm not necessarily endorsing any of these, but that we are at a really critical movement, a moment in our movement. The first one is talking about clean meat. Has anybody else heard of this? Okay, so... What clean meat is doing is it's taking the cells from animals, okay, living animals, so they're not having to slaughter them, and they're basically growing, they're culturing that meat, so you can grow that meat without having to raise all these animals. It's the same kind of technology we use for if I was a, in a fire and I burned off part of my arm, we could um, take some skin cells, culture it, and then graft new skin onto my body. So clean meat does use green, fewer greenhouse gas emissions and way less water. And it's something actually that a lot of big companies, like large corporations, are starting to think about. And they estimate that this will be on the market within the next five years. And again, I'm not saying that this is a perfect solution, but I have been doing this work for a long time and realized that taste is another important thing, right, that we have to consider. If we want to talk about large scale like shifts in diet, like this is something that, uh, that is being proposed. If you do not want to eat clean meat, I understand it's, to a lot of kids, sounds like very science fiction-y. Uh, but there are other alternatives already on the market. Raise your hand if you've heard of Beyond Meat or the Impossible Burger, right? So all of those things, uh, this past week there was the Good Food Conference here in San Francisco, which brought together a lot of these innovators, and then even Tyson and Cargill were there, and they were looking at these kinds of products. By the way, Just is based here in San Francisco. And what all these scientists are doing is they're saying, we want the hardcore beef lovers, the guy who's basically saying, I'm literally on the opposite pole from a vegetarian. In no conceivable universe would I accept any substitute for meat, right? They're going after those people. <laughs> so that's what um, some of the dialogue is. Because again, people are really starting to recognize the importance of food in the climate change movement. It turns out that eating more plant-based foods has a huge impact on the market. So the fastest growing sector of the grocery store industry is plant-based alternatives. Please don't think that I want everybody to go out and buy like just like Beyond Meat or anything like need that every single day. Nine out of 10 Americans don't eat enough vegetables. Like please eat vegetables, like all that. <laughs> I probably eat like very similarly to all of you. But I talk to a lot of kids who eat at fast food chains every day, right? So I'm, I'm talking to, to that kind of group that's eating that standard American diet. Those are the types of people who are starting to become what I would call flexitarians. It's really like the millennials and the Generation Zers who will go to a grocery store and buy something like almond milk, right? And that really does have huge repercussions. The CEO of Tyson Chicken invested $100 million in Beyond Meat, not because he cares about chicken welfare, right? He did that because he saw that that's where the market was headed. So that's, again, like the power of our, our consumption, of our food dollars. A uh, little quick side story. I used to be a classroom teacher on the Navajo Reservation, if anybody's ever been to New Mexico. And I was working in a school that was extremely poor. We were what was called a turnaround school. Every single breakfast and every single lunch was free for the kids. And whenever I had to do cafeteria duty, I literally had to walk around and force the kids to open up their milk. And I was told by my principal that if I didn't do that, we wouldn't get our funding. I want you all to keep in mind that 
Most human beings are lactose intolerant, right? Most Asians, most Africans, indigenous, native people. We drink milk in this country because this land was colonized by Europeans, right? And now we're all trying to adapt to this diet. You all, if you went to public schools, had dairy milk. <laughs> like, nod your head if you had dairy milk at your school. Haven't you ever wondered why that was? Like, why were you given dairy milk every single day? <laughs> and it was really baffling for me as a teacher because my kids were all lactose intolerant. They all experienced digestive issues. They were all like, they were very gassy. They would go to the bathroom a lot, which made them miss class time. But over and over again, I was told that we will not get our funding if you don't make these kids drink their milk. And we wouldn't even let the kids drink water. So there is, it's really amazing to me though that like people in the Bay Area, they started to purchase the soy milk, the rice milk, the almond milk, and the Walmart in Galb, New Mexico is now starting to sell those plant-based alternative milks, right? That wouldn't have, ha wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been consumer demand for that. So that's where I'm like starting to see some of these shifts and some, I guess, hope. <laughs> this slide is just showing like some of the, you know, alternatives that are out there on the market and just showing that, again, these are accessible at Walmart, at Target. There was a time when Gardein Crispy Tenders was very expensive, okay? This is an animal-free alternative. But now, because again, more people wanted to buy it, supply increased, costs went down. You can get this at not just Whole Foods, not just at Rainbow Grocery, but you can get it at Target, at Grocery Outlet, at Walmart, right? And it costs like $3 or something like that. So it's an alternative that's out there. Ben & Jerry's has a non-dairy line, which is incredible. And I think that, again, they did that because there was consumer demand for it. All right, so this is all bringing me to the Green Monday program, which was started in Hong Kong and has grown really significantly. Uh, and what I really like about this program is that they say that there's no one right way to do it. <clears throat> The first way is, of course, like routine-based. For the kids, they eat what their family eats at breakfast and at dinner, but maybe, hey, you have control over what you eat at lunch. Great, then a third of your meals could be more plant-based. Uh, it could be portion-based. In China, I feel like a lot of uh, family meals, they have like four dishes. If you can make you know, two of them uh, vegetable-based, that's great, that's progress. It can be impact-based as well. Uh, last year, do you remember how Governor Jerry Brown had this big like, global climate summit? And then, of course, we all marched afterwards. <laughs> but they were talking about how if, if we know that beef has a really strong impact on climate change, then maybe we need to be reducing that. And so we'll say something along the lines of, hey, maybe instead of having a steak take up your entire plate, have a bowl, fill it with veggies. It can be rice, quinoa, veggie, whatever, and then put two ounces of steak on top. So you're eating steak still. You still get your steak. I'm not threatening you. But you're eating less of it, and that makes a difference. Okay? And you can tell that I've given these presentations a lot, and so I'm really familiar with the kinds of reactions that we get. <laughs> there are a lot of different um, places where Green Monday can work. We worked in their first city to pass this resolution was Berkeley. And so what this means is all Berkeley city council meetings are now vegan, because uh, they only meet once a week, so that wasn't very hard for them. And that's cool because it sets an example. And then all Berkeley city-owned facilities are vegan one day a week. And then myself and I'd say about 30 kids from UC Berkeley and like all my high school interns, we went to every single restaurant in Berkeley to encourage them to feature a plant-based option, either create a new one, have a Green Monday special, or to just highlight it in some way. And it can be done in many ways. Like if they are a coffee shop, then maybe they don't charge an extra like 50 cents for the almond milk that day. Maybe they could offer like a deal with their special. So lots of different ways that that happens. And we passed this in Emeryville um, just a few months ago, and then now we're passing it in other uh, cities as well. If you go to our website, greenmondayus.org, you can see that we are going to a lot of different campuses, a lot of different corporations, and to uh, cities, and trying to help them be a part of this movement, this Green Monday movement. And you yourself can join. You can go to greenmondayus.org, and you can create a team. And then what's really cool is that on the website, I unfortunately don't have the slide for it in this presentation, we can calculate your impact. So we can tell you, like say you work at 
an office where there's five people. Say you get three people to commit to eating plant-based at least one day a week. We will tell you what your team saved in terms of carbon, in terms of water, in terms of animals, land, all that stuff. So it's a really exciting thing. Sometimes with different companies, we'll have them we do competitions to see you know, which floor of the company can save the most, <laughs> or division can you know, have the most pledges and like, save the most carbon. It's been really cool to see so many cities have climate action plans and so many companies, because if your goal is to reduce your carbon emissions by X percentage, the fastest way to do that is through your food choices. And so that's been a major selling point of this whole thing. So, I want to tell you a little bit more about some of the other stuff that we're doing. We have uh, a lot of different internship opportunities available, and I bring this up even though many of you probably aren't students, because you probably know a student. And I started this because I think I was giving all these presentations and just realizing that kids are really anxious and depressed <laughs> these days. And they, they maybe like after a presentation, they're like, hey, I really want to do something. But if they don't have the connections, then they're very unlikely to do things, right? So I want a, a way to bring more of these kids together. So through our internship programs, uh, we are getting together. We are learning how to be better activists, how to be these leaders. We do everything from public speaking trainings to leafleting to, again, this big global clim youth-led climate strike on September 20th. And we also learn how to cook food. Cooking food is a really big deal for us, but I want to give them the tools so that when they go to college or they graduate, they have the opportunities to eat more healthily and be able to feed more people in their lives, feed their communities. I think that that's really important. We do have internships here in the Bay Area. We also have internships uh, that can be remote and in each of our different regions as well. So we're, again, in 10 different cities. Like, if you know people in Chicago, Salt Lake City, Portland, LA, Seattle, like all those types of big cities, we've got chapters there. And even if you're in, I'm going to say random, even though Kansas is not random. It's just I've never been there, so I don't know anything about it. But say there's a kid in Kansas who really wants to make a difference. They can join us remotely. We go through something called the Changemaker Project, where the kids like learn about how factory farming relates to environment, social justice, LGBTQ issues, how eating meat is associated with masculinity, and how there's this idea that you need to eat that to be a real man, right? Like, we talk about all these issues, and then we give them a chance to discuss it with each other, and actually, they get to pitch projects for how they would try and address some of these issues and get funding for that. So that's just some of what we do, and I hope that you'll tell other kids that you know about some of these opportunities. Well, that's my presentation. If you have internet access right now. I just love your thoughts on the presentation. It only takes a minute. You just go to bit.ly slash FFAC Monica and that will help.